program coordinator here at the VIC. First and foremost, thank you for being here. We really appreciate having you all here and supporting the, the work that we do here. This is Jesse Rock. Jesse, I'm going to embarrass you just for a minute. Stellar student, stellar student worker. He's a Smitty grad and is now, I'm certain, a stellar professional in his own right too, and works for the Rush Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society of New York. And I'm not going to reread his presentation, but he's going to spend about 30 minutes with us today and warm us up for the keynote speaker. So please welcome Jesse. Thanks for being here. How are you doing, everyone? Uh, good. Some of y'all may recognize me. I've talked at just uh, the, the ABC event here probably the past three or four years, not jump, jumping over COVID. Um, <laughs> In a row, I, I presented some of my uh, research here one time. I've talked about some of the college's work with the Adirondack Bird Conservancy. Um, and uh, now I've moved on from the college a little, but I'm still happy to be associated with the VIC with some awesome programming here. So a little about myself and what we're going to talk about today is it's about 30 minutes of me discussing um, some of the forest management 
uh, work that is done locally and within the northern uh, North Country region, helping our bird species and improving the habitat for land um, on landowners' properties across the Adirondacks. <clears throat> so again, me, Jesse Roth, a PSC graduate. Um, I did my bachelor's in ecological restoration. My master's degree work was in natural resource conservation and management, focusing in forestry and aquatics. Um, and I'm currently uh, the wildlife forester for the Rough Grouse Society of American Woodcock Society for New York State. RGS has been around since the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> they uh, are a national organization, actually international now, including Canada. <laughs> But um, a lot of the work that we've done over the years has been focused on um, habitat restoration, habitat creation for early successional species. So these are birds and wildlife that rely on young forests and young forest habitat. However, um, in more recent years, and thankfully for my position and for the future of our organization, um, that focus has gone a shifted from just creating habitat, young forest habitat, to a broader range of interests um, looking at the more overall dynamic forest approach. So trying to help balance all different elements that a, a forest habitat provides and different forest types and different forest structure on a property. So wildlife forestry and the work that I do um, <clears throat> essentially is taking forest ecology and silviculture and using it to provide the needs for wildlife at both a landscape and a stand level scale. Stands is the term we use in forestry to define an area of forest that's all of similar type in some way, shape, or form. That could be on a property, it's a piece that's all conifer, it's a piece that's all <clears throat> maple and beech mix. You know, it's it's way we kind of arbitrarily draw maps and draw lines on a map for defining what a forest may be considered. So the work that I do now is geared towards forest restoration a lot of times for not just young forest species, for a whole host of species. Um, one of our objectives that we work towards is the idea of creating a matrix of habitat types. So if you have a landowner who has a thousand acres, it's a nice piece of property, um, we look at diversifying that property so you have different elements of different forest types scattered across that property. You have a percentage that's young forest, a percentage that's old forest. Get to that in a moment here. Um, but focusing, you know, these are some of the species that a lot of our work targets around because um, they are species that are pretty selective in their forest type, along with being um, some are pretty selective. For example, we have golden wing warblers in the center here and American woodcock. These are species that are known for getting early successional forests, young forests to, to thrive. Um, golden wing warblers are unique in the fact, though, that they not only need young forests. They need old growth forests as well. They need both of them in close proximity. So while they may raise their young and they, well, they nest in young, very, very young forests, very, very dense cover, um, as soon as those young are able to fledge, they're moving into older growth forests in order to be able to feed and grow. So what's this shifting mosaic approach? When I work with a landowner, I'm trying to help them develop a better plan for their property and a better plan towards managing their forest. Um, mixing it up in a way of about 50% of their property being late successional forests, so it's older forest, gearing towards older growth forest. Um, 30 to 40% is going to be in mixed ages and uh, mixed and open forests. So you're going to have areas that have <clears throat> very large trees with big open areas in between them. Those of you who might have walked my uh, walk this morning, we took a little section of the Boreal Light Trail where there's been some wildlife thinnings done and some wildlife cuttings where they opened up sections of the forest to allow sunlight through and reach the forest floor while still maintaining older trees in the canopy. Um, this provides a great diversity of habitat for bird species and provides cover at different times of the year and different times of their life cycle. And then lastly, we're only looking at about 10% to 15% of a property being composed of really young forests situated specifically for young forest birds like rough grouse, woodcock, Golden wind warbler in their nest. Um, these species that rely on these really young, high density areas of trees. So, <clears throat> what do I do in an actual day to day job? Well, as part of RGS's goal in the region, is we work with private landowners and um, helping them with forest stewardship opportunities intended to benefit both forest health and forest dependent wildlife. 
So my position works in conjunction with a lot of great partners, um, the NRCS, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. That's weird, Indiana University of PA, but <laughs> move on. Um, it's a great research institution, and also the Working Lands for Wildlife program. What these programs are is they're cost share programs or reimbursement programs that help landowners who are trying to improve their property for wildlife. So <clears throat> NRCS offers programs through what they call EQIP and Conservation Standards Practices, um, Standards and Practices Program, CSP. Uh, these programs help landowners who otherwise maybe couldn't necessarily afford to improve their property for wildlife reasons to give them that option. So we can kind of take the assumption that a lot of the times the most economic approach to managing a piece of property and the most beneficial for wildlife don't collide, or they don't, they don't come together, they kind of collide. Um, a term we deal with a lot in our region is what they call high grading, whereas a logger will come into a forest, take everything of value and leave everything that doesn't have much value, that's including timber value and also wildlife value. Um, these programs are in place to try and help offset that, to give that landowner who maybe financially is really needing the most they can get out of their property to balance some of the wildlife improvement work with the losses they'd be taking for not just logging it hard and taking all the trees out. Um, the Working Lands for Wildlife Program is a quick highlight on that because that's my main program I work with. Um, the highlighted area is in New York State or where we do working lands for wildlife work primarily, and that is because most working lands work is tailored towards improving habitat for golden wing warblers. <clears throat> um, as we get up into the St. Lawrence Valley, warblers are become more and more prolific. Um, but the habitat up there is threatened primarily um, through a lot of invasive species issues. So we, while we have a lot of great young forests in the north here, the Adirondacks, a lot of it's heavily populated with species like buckthorn, Japanese bush honeysuckle, or animal bittersweets. A lot of species that, while they create young forest cover, it is nowhere near as valuable as the natural and native young forest cover. So, on a daily basis, what I'm doing in the field and when I'm working, um, I'm performing forest inventories, helping landowners improve their forests through giving them basically the analysis and instructions on how to take what they had and make it better, whether that's helping remove invasive species, giving them plans on which they can help forest regeneration in areas where maybe they had heavy logging at one time in the past, um, how they can improve the health of their forest in terms of their timber quality, and all that in the context of what they're doing is going to improve their land for wildlife. <clears throat> So a couple of current projects we've been working on. Um, well, I've been working on here in New York. Uh, Paul Smith College, we actually did a partnership with, with RGS uh, where they did a stand reset on some of their property where it had regenerated very poorly um, with the trees that came back after it was cut about I think 20 years ago had regenerated very poorly. Um, there was a lot of disease trees. Um, there was a really bad issue with beech bark disease. If anyone knows what that is, it is a fungus caused disease that kills beech trees, prevents them from ever reaching maturity and producing beech nuts. Um, so eventually what happens is the beech will regenerate vigorously from their root systems and they'll <clears throat> um, shade out all the other vegetation that would come in in an area. And you end up with a monoculture of beech, which is not very valuable for wildlife. It's not very valuable for forestry, for timber value, or any value for that that matter. I mean, since it's all disease, it all dies before it reaches maturity and its own value for wildlife and things like that. So we helped them with the stand reset there. Um, <clears throat> we've done up, let's see, now north of here in Ellenburg, we've been doing a lot of aspen releases and invasive species management. We actually have a partnership right now with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They have a property in Westville. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. It's just north of Malone. It's part of one of their larger properties in Vermont that they somehow have a little piece of land just north of us that they own and manage. Um, however, they have no capability to manage it because they don't have the faculty, and they don't have the staff to manage it. So RGS partnered with them in the way that <clears throat> U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to fund the work, and we're going to help orchestrate it. We're going to do the conservation work. We're going to go in and help 
um, remove some of the invasive species that are in the property. We're going to look at resetting. There's a large wetland um, on the property that was planted with Norway spruce back in the 60s. And um, so it's just basically a monoculture of Norway spruce. We're going to remove all that and look at creating nat native wetland vegetation there, try to reestablish alders and some other species for species like woodcock, and then for nesting areas for wood duck and mallards and other species. <clears throat> so in the region in total, over the past year that I've been with RGS, um, I've been able to help about two, uh, 20 landowners and um, impacting about 2,000 acres of forests. So that's, again, helping to improve those forests for wildlife like birds, um, specifically focusing on like grouse, woodcock, golden wing warblers, um, <clears throat> but a broader focus on a lot of our different species in our region. Um, we've also helped create over 300 acres of new habitat for golden wing warblers, specifically looking at nesting habitat. Um, this was through creating really young, helping to create young forests, um, establishing sound forestry practices that regenerate um, species like oaks and aspen, um, along with doing invasive species removal, a lot of buckhorn removal up in the St. Lawrence Valley. And we've also helped to administer uh, some major and minor grant work in New York State forest, WMAs, and federal lands. Um, Upper and Lower Lakes, which is not too far here, it's out towards Potsdam. Um, we're working on a project with them, helping them to regenerate some of their forest um, and helping the invasive species management program there. <clears throat> so my talk isn't super long today, but I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I kind of want to leave the end open for questions. If anyone has questions on like what we do for forestry, what what things we can do to help grouse and woodcock, maybe you have property where um, you'd be interested in what you can do to improve your land for wildlife and how to answer some of those questions. Be you in touch with the right people who'd be able to help you. But uh, if you do want to reach out with any questions personally, <laughs> the loons have rejected. <laughs> um, you can feel free to reach out to me. I have some business cards up here along with some pamphlets on some of the work that we do and help with. Um, but uh, it's been a pleasure coming here for the past three years, well, five years probably at this point. Um, and I thank all the folks who come here to the <clears throat> to this event because it is a great great opportunity to see such a passionate group of individuals who love the outdoors, who love the forests and the trees and the birds that live within them. So thank you very much for your time today. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thanks, Jesse. Yes. Two questions, actually. One, is the state very helpful in, in this program? I know they have things for you know, tree sales mm -hmm. and things like that. So do you work a lot with them? And are they complementary programs to what you're doing? And the second question is, the two organizations, I don't really know anything about them, but were they hunter-based originally? Are they still largely hunter-based? Or is that the focus of those organizations change? Yeah, so to start with the first question on the state, um, we do work some with the state. We work some of the state lands and the state wildlife management units. We have cooperative agreements um, in terms of where like, we provide management assistance in the terms of forest management plans, project plans. Um, sometimes we provide actual field, excuse me, field assistance with some of our member-based volunteering and doing work. Um, additionally, what we also do provide is the big time with the state relationship is we can get private grants that the state isn't necessarily eligible for, and we can use that money to help fund work on state land. <clears throat> um, but the for the state programs, one of the common ones people talk about is 480A. It's a tax break program. That allows if you enroll your property, you have a forest management plan, you can enroll in a tax break program that helps. Um, it, it basically the state keeps an eye on what you're doing on your property and gives you kind of the green light of what it's doing is what you're doing is good forestry. And in that return, you get a tax break program. I don't work too much directly with it. I work more with the um, the national, the NRCS and the US Department of Agriculture level work, but I have assisted some with that state level stuff. And then on the uh, the hunter base, yes, it was a hunter based organization to begin with. It is still our main support base. Um, grouse and woodcock are game birds that people love and cherish. And, you know, when when people start noticing that those birds are disappearing, it, it throws a big red beacon up because 
lot of people are very concerned about them. Um, but we have seen in recency especially a broader interest just because of the work we've been doing. Um, people have been more interested in our organization from outside that kind of sphere of the population. Yes. I guess invasive species have become a big problem in New York State. How, mm -hmm. how do you uh, get rid of them? How, what techniques do you use? Yeah, so there's a lot of different methods. Um, depending on the severity of the invasion, a, a species we work with a lot is buckthorn. Um, buckthorn is a it's a small it's a shrub essentially, so it grows through the height of a small tree. Uh, produces berries that are very abundant, but when wildlife eat them, they don't really give them a whole lot of value. Um, food source wise, it's it's not to be crude, but it's kind of like if you ate Taco Bell for every single meal of your life. Um, and it's not really going to treat you very well after a while. And uh, what happens with those, if the invasion is small enough, a lot of the time with manual labor, going and cutting the tree, um, pulling up the roots. If they're, if they're too large to rip the root systems out, you cut and then you chemically treat the stump so that it dies down through the root system. Um, if they're really big invasions, uh, sometimes it has to be to the level of going in with a bulldozer and scraping the top layer of soils, pulling out all the root systems and re-spreading soil back into an area. They also burn in some regions. Um, <clears throat> not so much in New York, but they do treat invasives like buckthorn a lot in PA through burning. Uh, there also is, while well, I don't like to see it as much, um, there is mass chemical killing too, where they essentially like round up an entire area and just keep hitting it and hitting it. And the problem with doing that is while it does work, it, it takes usually three to five applications of very heavy chemicals to, to kill them off. Kind of further to that question, I wanted to ask you specifically about the site um, north of Malone, mm -hmm. where I think you said north yeah, of Malone. Yeah, Westville, yeah. Yeah, what's that actually look like? Like, what do you, I mean, you're going to remove all the, you'll take out all the Norway spruce? And so it is on that property there, there's about a, a six or seven acres. That's, it's an old wetland that was part of a farm field, and because it was very wet there, um, when they turned it over, the farmer at one point must have decided that it wasn't worth dealing with into, as a soil saving means, they planted a bunch of trees on it. They planted Norway spruce. Norway spruce are a non-native species. They look really nice in your yards, but when you get a giant block of them that's eight acres in size, it becomes kind of a dead zone for a lot of wildlife species. So what that would look like in particular um, is we'd probably have a logger come in who would take all the Norway spruce out and basically remove every single tree that's Norway spruce in that area. And then we'd have to come back in and do tree plantings because um, <clears throat> uh, we're probably not going to get much for regen. There's going to be seeding, plantings, and then you're going to be monitoring that probably for the next five to 10 years, trying to keep invasive species from invading the area and then adding in to those plantings whenever possible, trying to diversify the age of the regen that's coming up. And do you, in your partnerships, is there a requirement for the landowner mm -hmm. to engage physically and help with the work that needs to be done, or is that really variable in terms of? It's pretty variable. So the way these programs work are most of them are orchestrated through the National Resource Conservation Service. And um, you enroll your property with them. And then they have different um, programs you can enroll in. I'll go with EQIP for an example. It's an Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And this is the program that's designed to help you do work that's normally cost, it's not very cost efficient to do, but it's very good for wildlife and for other um, <clears throat> ecological, for sound ecological forestry means. So the way that works is each practice as they define it is a particular um, <clears throat> action you can take on your property. So like invasive species management falls under what they call brush management, which is a code 314. It's a mess, it's all government red tape, but essentially <laughs> um, what happens with that is um, they'll pay a certain amount of money per acre to the landowner for them to help to help them do that work on their property. Um, and then you enroll in that program, your property gets ranked in terms of how beneficial the work you're doing is to the grand scheme of your property of your region. And if your project gets funded, you then get the funding to do the work. And then the landowner can do the work themselves. They can hire a contractor to do it. Or if it's more forestry related work, it's often getting in touch with a logger 
in reaching an agreement of what work is going to be done following very strict guidelines set by the NRCS and me, since I'm the forester for RGS helping with these projects, um, on what's acceptable, what's good management practices, what's going to be good for the forest, and what's going to be hurtful. And um, if they violate those terms, um, there's usually repercussions. So it's something that's intended to help not only to help landowners financially, but to help them also have kind of a little bit of a stronger arm when it comes to a logger. I'm not knocking loggers. I have family who are loggers. I love loggers. But um, I mean, it's a business. And sometimes corners are cut. NRCS gives a little bit of a stronger hold on the fact that if you're cutting corners, you're going to you're be in trouble for that one. A lot of landowners are scared with the fact of getting someone on their property who they don't know and they don't feel like they can maybe trust. And having that connection with NRCS and having the U.S. Department of Agriculture behind you makes usually lowers those concerns a little bit. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there a minimum acreage? Yeah, um, depending on which programs you're in, uh, for for NRCS, like equip, no, um, it's, it's pretty small. Um, I think realist, it's more like realistic minimum acreage. There's a minimum acreage to the point where your projects aren't going to compete well enough with other ones in the region. You probably won't get funded. But we've done work down to three, four acres. So there are options out there. In, in that process, can you collaborate with your neighbors to go ahead and kind of gain some acreage and gain some value in, in the net result? Mm -hmm. Yep, yes. You can. Uh, there are options for... Um, multiple properties and, and landowners to work together on getting work done. Um, usually what it results in is, uh, you know, we have a, a few instances right now where we're actually trying to get multiple landowners together so we can get one logger in there to make it profitable for the logger. Because the work that he's doing, if he just does it on one property, it's not enough to make the loggers, it's not gonna make the loggers time. He's not gonna be willing to do it. But if we have four or five properties connected together, it's enough work to be done and for management work to be done to give it the incentive for that longer to actually come in and do the work. It's um it's a lot more economics than I wish it was <laughs> because of these programs, but they uh, they still do, do some awesome work. And there's a lot broader to NRCS. It's not just forest and tree cutting. It's, it's creating wetlands. It's helping restore streams. It's helping restore pastures. It's uh, creating habitat for grassland birds. It's, it's very broad the work that they do. I'm just stuck. I'm just over here on the forestry end primarily. Do you um, going back to the other question before about the hunting? If mm -hmm. you participate in the programs, does that mean you open up that property to hunting, or is that separate? And nope, that is completely. Okay. It, it is your property, and it is your choice of what you do and what you manage it for. And that's the nice thing about the Equip and CSP programs. Um, a lot of folks are more familiar with the. That's my get out of here. Uh, <laughs> questions. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, that's the. Uh, the whole case. Uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of people are very familiar with conservation easements, um, and that is that where you you open up your property to public access. Um, these programs are completely separate. Thanks, Jesse. This is really interesting. Thank <laughs> you. 
That sounds like that works. It works. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm not going to use it. <laughs> Again, if anybody wasn't here for the last talk, thank you so much for coming. I'm really happy to have you. A huge shout out to Northern New York Audubon, um, the Joseph and Joan Coleman Conservation Fund provided a grant to us so that we could bring Ivan here. So they've, they've underwritten the keynote speaker. Which, thank you. And this is definitely the easiest introduction I've ever done because Ivan specifically asked me not to really introduce him. <laughs> and uh, that is because he is going to tell us not just about the science of birds, his podcast, but a little bit about himself and how the whole thing evolved. So without further ado, Ivan Phillipson. <laughs> I think we want to turn down one light stuff. So we can get rid of this. Forgive me for a second. I am going to use the microphone. I like to use the microphone when I can. Uh, I will maybe stand down here for the moment just so you can see me. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. This is really, really cool, really exciting. Um, thank you, Martha. Thank you, yeah, for BIC, for all of this. Just, you know, getting me here. This is really an honor. I'm very excited to be here. I've not explore this part of the continent before. This is a, a new region for me. Um, some of the birds are still would be lifers if I see them on this trip, so I'm keeping my eyes peeled, and my ears. Um, so yeah, it's just really neat to, to see this environment. For those of you who live in this area, this is a fantastic, beautiful place, so congrats. Yeah, so um, you know, I, I did a somewhat similar talk a little while ago, and, and the gentleman who introduced me did this long Thing kind of detailing my entire CV, and I was like, oh no, that's, that's, that's the first half of my talk. <laughs> Spoiler alert. So, anyway, so yes, yeah, so let me um, let me uh, talk about this science of birds thing here. So that is why I'm here because I have this podcast. Uh, that's what put me on the radar of folks here. So before I get into all that, uh, let me just ask, and don't be shy, but is there anyone who doesn't know what a podcast is? Fantastic. Okay, so that means you know what they are, and you probably listen to some. That's great. Just just have to check, right? Because uh, it's a very specific thing. I do know people who have never listened to a podcast in their life, don't really know what they are, even though they've been around for 20 years or so. It's still kind of a new thing. Oh, there was. Oh, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, great. We're great. We're learning new things today. It's wonderful. Yes. Okay. Well, wonderful. So, um, yeah, the science of birds have got me here. You know, if um, the way I like to think about it, it's kind of and forgive me, Todd, but it's kind of like the modern radio, right? Um, it's on demand. It's like YouTube is sort of like a modern version of television for some folks. Podcasts are like modern version of radio. Anybody can start a podcast. It's, you know, it costs a little bit per month to host your podcast, but it's not terribly expensive. So it kind of represents the democratization of something like radio. It's pretty cool. So let's talk about it. Now, this is not John. It's a bridal tip mouse, but I want to tell you about John. John uh, is a young man, a teenager in high school. I'll come up here now. Uh, I'll probably be moving around. I'd like to do that. Um, John is a, a fan of the podcast, and his dad listened to it. And his dad sent me an email. And let me see if I can cue it up here. So this is what Matthew, John's dad, wrote an excerpt. John loves your podcast for the science, but he also gets consistent laughs out of the humor that you drop in, right on his wavelength. The reason for my note is to express my deep appreciation for the learning and fun you bring John and me. Thank you. Your podcast has served so many purposes for us, from expanding John's knowledge to cracking us up to giving us topics we can continue to discuss together once we are done listening. 
So that's really cool to get something like that. John is a budding ornithologist. Even though he's in high school, he knows already that he wants to be an ornithologist. And so I have this correspondence with John and his dad now, and they're asking about you know, where should we go to college and all this kind of thing. So, you know, and I, I still get a little bit of imposter syndrome uh, with this kind of things. So I'm like, am I the guy that should be answering this kid about his future? Um, <laughs> sure, sure, why not? Uh, they ask. So, but it basically it's an honor to get these kind of things coming at you and you know, this kind of feedback, this kind of correspondence. So it, it's, it's quite a wild thing. And that's one of many examples of kids and their parents enjoying this kind of stuff. So tonight, today, forgive me, today, uh, there's several things I want to talk about. I will tell you a bit about what brought me to this stage right now, how I got here. And I also want to talk about the power of podcasting and the so-called new media, right? Which someday is not going to be new. It's been around for 15, 20 years, but it's still called new media. Podcasting being my specialty at the moment. And I also want to talk a little bit about how I think the study of birds is one of the best vehicles or lenses through which you can look to understand nature and to understand science. Because that's kind of what I'm doing here, right? So those are kind of the, the three main things I'm doing. So there's me and mom in the 80s. Uh, so we're backing this up a little bit. Mom with her super cool mullet and using me as an armrest for some reason. And there I am with my binoculars. So I was already a little naturalist back then. And I've got my little aquarium full of probably tadpoles. Because when I was a kid, it's not that I didn't like birds, but I wasn't really into birds. I was into reptiles and amphibians. I was a herper kid. So I'm out there bucking around, you know, tricking around in ponds, flipping logs, overlooking for salamanders and turtles and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, of course, the birds were there, right? They were singing and they were bouncing around in the bushes, demanding my attention, but I was laser focused on herps at that time. So I was drawing pictures of frogs, just super stoked about all this stuff. And I knew when I was a little kid that I wanted to be a scientist. And I also felt like I probably wanted to be a teacher of some kind. So that was the beginning. And I'm lucky enough that I got to pursue that interest and those passions. And I went to college and I went to grad school. This is me mucking around still in my early 20s or late 20s in the Olympic Mountain National Park in Washington State looking for frogs. Like that's what I was doing, you know, if you get to pick the critter you study, well, I picked frogs. And again, meanwhile, there are birds all around me. And I was, at this point, getting very interested in birds and learning their songs and calls and looking around. But still, still very much a herper person. But along the way, I had friends, believe it or not, and some of them were birders, and they would take me out birding. So I got to, to have this, these experiences. And, um, you know, that were really cool. And that's what's great about birding, right? It's social. I mean, look at, look at you guys. You're all here. This is all these wonderful events. Uh, I, it's very social compared to some of these other uh, hobbies or interests. So one little story. Uh, I was an undergraduate in Southern California where I grew up, Cal Poly Pomona. And I'm walking around with my friend David, and he was more into birds. And so he hears something scuffling around in the bushes on campus. And he said, wait, wait, wait stop now. Look, can you hear that? Like, oh, yeah, I guess I can hear that. And, Look, 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 this little guy down here. And sure enough, I see this drab little scrap. Anybody want to guess what that is, knowing that it's from Southern California? That's California in the name. <laughs> <laughs> California toby. It's California toby. It's got a little, little bit of rust under the tail there in the vent. So, you know, not a very exciting looking bird, but I consider this my spark bird because of that moment of realizing that one could just be walking around and hear something. See, you know, with birds, with herps, you don't really hear much. Frogs, of course, being the exception. But, um, you know, it was just, it really was a very meaningful moment. And I'm sure you have lots of stories like that yourselves. Maybe you have a spark bird, something that brought you here. So, California Toby, I credit for that. So, this is Oregon State University. This is where I got my PhD, and uh, I had a great time. It really was a, a dream come true to become a scientist, to do science published papers, all of the things that I thought were cool about all that. Um, you know, but along the way, towards the end of all that, after doing a postdoc, I realized that I think I need to consider another path, that academia wasn't really the best fit for me. It's an okay fit, maybe not the best. So I had a bit of an existential crisis. What do I do now? <laughs> I just spent you know, my adult life in school, 
and racked up a bunch of debt. And so what do I do now? Well, when you have an existential crisis, usually the best thing to do is to buy a van and start your own business. You know? Everybody will be like, uh, what, what are you doing? So this is in Portland, Oregon. So I started a local nature tour business called Volcano Lands. If you don't know, Portland, Oregon is surrounded by volcanoes. And this was the van, and got a bird on the side. That was the logo. Anybody want to guess what the logo is? Very thrush. Yes, very thrush. Very thrush. Uh, one of our nice kind of northwestern birds. We don't have a lot of birds that are unique to the northwest, but this is a good candidate for that. So, volcano lands. So I did this van. I started taking folks out. It's not. They're not birding tours. Not. They're not marketed as birding tours. Just nature tours, a lot of hiking, look at waterfalls. But it allowed me to, rather than narrow down as you do in academia, to just you know, one little thing that you're studying and that's your thing forever and ever, this allowed me to broaden my interests again and get back to being a naturalist. Talking about the plants and the geology, the insects, everything, everything that crossed our path, which was fantastic. And of course, birds were there all along. As you marry thrush, if you're not familiar, it's kind of like a little hot rod robin, very colorful for the brush, orange and black, beautiful haunting song, amazing bird. So there I am running around, leading these tours, primarily for tourists. These are people coming to Portland, Oregon, when Portland was the hot place to, to travel to about 10 years ago. And I'm uh, holding up a chanterelle mushroom, I'm holding a frog, you know, all kinds of good fun. But the birds are there the whole time, and I'm getting, I'm becoming more attuned to the birds. I'm learning their calls and their songs, their habitats, you know, making little lists every day. I've got a list of what we saw on that particular tour, so I'm starting to list things. So, you know, one day you look in the mirror and despite your best efforts, you realize you <laughs> I didn't feel like I, I felt like that was like this badge. I can't can't, you know, uh, who am I to call myself a burger? But eventually I felt like, okay, I think I, I think I, I can do this. Also, if this is what you see in the mirror, you might be a vampire. <laughs> Where are you? I don't know. So having that tour business, I eventually shuttered that. It was doing okay, but for reasons I had a business partner and we had some, some fights. So uh, I had, in the meantime, connected with the Portland Audubon Society and started doing some uh, one-off adult classes, like one-hour classes about all kinds of things, and that was fun put me on their radar, and then they invited me to start doing some local multi-day tours, which is very exciting. But birding, right? Very much birding. So now we're going all in on birds, um, which was, was great, because I was, I was ready for it. And so I did that for a couple of years, and then that led to me partnering up with the former director of education at the Portland Audubon Society, and us starting our own business, our own nature tour business. Well, latitudes, and this was about almost seven years ago now. And uh, yeah, so we started you know, doing trips all over the place. And ironically, not really in the Northwest at all, but just everywhere else. Um, a lot of international trips, places like Fiji, Australia, Uganda, Iceland, Ecuador, all over the place. So um, really, it's really, you know, just ridiculous that I need to do this. And so that's been great. So here's me in Oaxaca, Mexico, one of my favorite places to go birding, really lovely place. Some of you probably been there. There I am with my group. There I am in Iceland, another favorite place of mine, heading back there in a few weeks. It's very exciting, lovely place. So I'm doing all this travel now, which I never thought I would do. And there I am uh, getting paid to go look for birds, which is pretty cool. And you know, the birds just impressed me more and more. Their diversity, the fact that they are in essentially every habitat in every place you go, including urban habitats. And this, we all know this, right? But it's just, it, it really became more and more impressive to me, going to every, all these places and seeing these birds. And I was impressed by people's interest and reactions to birds, paying to go see them, getting all teary-eyed, seeing some little scrappy brown bird, you know, in some remote place. Because I'm there with them. I mean, I think that's great. Uh, and the power of birds as a teach, teachable moment, right? All these birds give us these teachable moments to talk about some aspect of natural history. It may have little to do with the actual bird. It might just be, the bird may be a jumping point, a jump off point to talk about some topic. It might even be a cultural topic, who knows? 
And so, great quote from John Muir, the clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. And I would modify that a bit and say, another clear way into the universe is through the study of birds. <laughs> right? Using a bird as a literal, literal window to the universe. Very kind of on the nose image there. So, traveling around, seeing birds, they're great. Um, the business is doing well, growing slowly. We're just a small operation, just two guys. And I, this, is, this is true. We're sitting around at his house one day, drinking a beer or two, patting ourselves on the back, saying, hey, isn't this amazing? We started this business. So, you know, everything's great. It's going well. This is late 2019, by the way. <laughs> and, and I literally say, I, I kid you not, I say something to the effect of, yeah, you know, everything's going to be great. And, uh, you know, as long as there isn't some kind of global calamity, <laughs> we're, we're sailing, buddy. Well, I'll know what happened next. So this is a graph of the number of passengers carried on planes around the world, time. And you've got these different events, right? The oil crisis in the 70s, uh, the Gulf crisis, the, uh, the 2008 economic uh, thing. And then, yeah, so there's some, right, the financial crisis. And then this is what happened in 2020, right? Just went off a cliff, right? And we all know this, this is, but it's just amazing to see, you know, the, all these other things paled in comparison to what happened in 2020. And you're in the travel business, right? You're like, oh, dang it. what do you do? So what does, what does a person do? Well, uh, you know, in this um, cauldron of uncertainty, well, you do what anybody does, and you go out and you buy a van, <laughs> and you consider living in it down by the river because you don't know if you're going to make money ever again. But, you know, really what I did was I started a podcast because I've got nothing but free time. I could, A, play a bunch of video games in my pajamas, or, B, I could start a podcast and do that in my pajamas. And that is what I did. So... Um, it was something I was interested in. It was on the back burner, like maybe somebody else started a podcast. Well, now I had this opportunity. So I didn't want to just sit around. I wanted to do something meaningful, something that might be, you know, of interest to other people. So I started this thing. And um, that was in September of 2020 when I first launched it. And I'm, you know, just about to put out the 77th episode. I put them out every couple weeks if I can. And um, they're scripted, so it takes a long time. I have to write a long script for each of these things because I didn't want to just do the typical podcast thing of having a guest and interviewing them or me just rambling for an hour on, on the podcast. I wanted it to be you know, very sort of not concise isn't the right word because they're not always concise, but um, pithy. I don't know. <laughs> and I have humor in it. If you listen to it, you know, I try to be funny. Um, and I, I have fun, and that's important. I want this thing to be fun. In the beginning, it was just this pandemic project, right? Let's just do this thing, because who knows what the future is going to bring? Who knows when travel is going to come back? So there I go. I go into my little closet, I record my podcast, and uh, you know, this is what I'm still doing to this day it works well. You go in there because there's all the clothes, and they dampen the echoes, right? It has good audio, um, audio qualities. It really does. You know, who cares? I mean, so. So the tagline for the podcast is a lighthearted exploration of bird biology for lifelong learners. That's you guys, right? Lifelong learners. Um, I didn't want it to be just for Americans, so it does not focus strictly on North American species, as I think some podcasts do, because uh, I know that, of course, anybody anywhere can listen as long as they speak English. I mean, if they don't, they could listen. But, um, you know, it's for the English-speaking world, and so um, I also wanted it to be not so much about birding, the activity, but about birds, about ornithology. You could be someone who doesn't ever go birding and still enjoy the podcast. If you like to learn, if you like nature, maybe you're just a, you know, a nature enthusiast. And I have plenty of people who, in fact, are self-identified that way. I even have a poll that I put out, you know, are you a birder? And a number of people are like, no, I'm just not. Or... You know, just very, very occasionally go birding. So, so that's really cool. It reaches a like, broad group of people. So what do I talk about in this thing? I talk about individual species. I did one on the common loon, one of your familiar birds here, for example. Um, I talk about basic aspects of bird biology. The avian skeleton, for example, was one, or how do birds fly, this basic stuff. Um, you know, sometimes just kind of random silly things. 
or you know, like did one on bird's nest soup recently. So there's interesting <laughs> things that have to do with birds. So these are just some images from the website. So how is it going? It's going pretty well, uh, and better than I ever could have expected, honestly. Um, so these are some stats as of the end of March. You know, in March there were 60,000 downloads across the 70 plus episodes. So lots of people are listening to this thing, thousands of people, and that is just really, really cool. Not, not, you, know, you have no idea when you put something out like this. If anybody's going to listen to it, besides mom. And uh, <laughs> so when it goes well, it's great. Now, I said it's not primarily for North Americans, and yet most of the people listening are North American, about maybe 80% of my audience. And that's fine. So I always have to keep that in mind. I do try to bias it a little bit towards North American birds. But a lot of people in Europe, Australia, you know, again, most of the English speaking world. And I'm getting lots of nice feedback, you know, reviews. Thankfully, those are mostly good. That's great, great to hear. So, um, this little project, this pandemic project, has become the greatest passion of my life. I had no idea, never would have predicted that. The tour business is great, and I love it, but this thing is the thing I'm most excited about. And I just see this great opportunity for teaching, and, you know, and I learn. It's a mechanism for me to learn more about birds, which is great, because when I study or when I research one of these episodes, I don't just have it all in my brain. I have to do research, dig into the textbooks, dig into the primary scientific literature. So I get to kind of get back into some of that as well, which is very cool. So it's the greatest passion of my life. I know I should probably say that it's my kids, but I don't have kids, so <laughs> pretty easy. You know how you go and you buy a frame and there's already a picture of somebody else's family. <laughs> Yeah, so, so no kids to distract me. I to focus on this thing, which is great. So, um, but yeah, you know, again, it's just this great thing. And then, you know, here are these opportunities to be here with you guys today because of this thing. I started in my pajamas in my closet. <laughs> so, so getting feedback from people, getting emails directly to me, getting reviews where people say these various things has kind of, as I've distilled that information over time, I've realized the power of what I'm doing, the power of podcasting in general, if done well, it has this amazing power for educating people and also for us as listeners to, to learn. Uh-oh, what did I do? <laughs> um, right? I listen to podcasts and I learn from you as well. So, um, and this is, I'm not the first person to realize this, but it's just, when you hear people saying, you know, I love this podcast, I, I've never listened to a podcast before, and I really, this one is great, it's opening my eyes and my ears, I didn't even really like birds before, I, I'm seriously, I get these kind of comments, you know, I wasn't even interested in birds, and now this is like changing things for me. Um, a lot of kids are listening, so um, that was not something I intended or, or expected. Parents will email and say, yeah, my seven-year-old listens to your podcast, go and sleep every night, and, you know, she loves it. She, you know, I'm like, oh, wait, is it, is it putting her to sleep? <laughs> I mean, that's what's going on. Uh, but, but, you know, this kid is quoting things from the podcast to their parents. So these kids, these will be the ornithologists of the future, or at least the birders of the future, right? So to connect with all that, it's amazing. It's a very powerful thing, and any of us can do that. And then again, birds as a focus for teaching and learning about the sciences, not just about birds, but so many other things. Because as I'm writing the scripts, putting these things together, just all these ideas are coming together. I wish I could make four hour long podcast episodes sometimes because you know there's just so much that you can connect to birds. But you know, um, the way we, as birders, often think about birds, and, and this may not apply to you at all, so, so forgive me if I'm generalizing here, but you know, one way of interacting with birds is going out there and going, okay, that's a such and such species, and maybe you list it, maybe you don't, but you go, cool, I, I know, I know, I can put a name to that. Job well done, move on to the next bird. What's the name? Next, 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 right? So, and that's fine. That's your, your way of enjoying birds. I do that myself sometimes, right? It's great. But maybe we can deepen our experience and, and maybe think about that bird a little more, spend a little more time with it, and maybe see what it's doing, because, Nothing exists in a vacuum, right? <laughs> there are things that are connected to that bird that you're looking at or that you're reading about. There's so many other things. So, um, you know, the things that the bird is eating, the things you're eating the bird, what it's interacting with in its environment, 
how the weather is affecting that bird, the, the non-living environment. So many things are going on. And then we can think about those things. And then we can think about what things are connected to those and how are those things interrelated. And then there's all kinds of loops and all kinds of weird things, right? So you get this network of, of information or interactions between the living and the non-living world. And you've seen this sort of thing before. You've seen these food webs in the science of ecology, right? It used to be the food, what they call the food chain, right? The food pyramid. More like a web because there's all these, you know, loops and things. And so again, this is nothing that, that I'm creating from scratch here. These are things that people know, but it's kind of fun to think about. Because if you keep going, if you keep making those connections, it goes on forever, doesn't it? You can go out to the edge of the universe from starting from just thinking about birds. And you know, you can do this with many things, but birds are a great way to do it. So, for example, uh, how about the Hawaii Akepa? It's a bird I saw recently on a tour in Hawaii, which is very cool. Beautiful little bird, about the most orange bird we have in the world, one of, one of the brightest orange birds. Um, this is a Hawaiian honey creeper in the Finch family. And not only does it only live in Hawaii, it only lives on one island, the Big Island. And on the Big Island, it only lives in a few patches of forest, the remnant forest. Thankfully, at least some of those are protected. And this bird is cool. Uh, you know crossbills, of course. Well, this bird, it's not easy to see here, but it has a crossed bill, much like a red crossbill. Um, it uses that to pry open little leaf buds and flower buds to get insects and things out of it. So it's an interesting bird for that reason. So we could go out and we could say, cool, the Kepa, put it on the list on eBird, job well done. Or we could learn some more about this bird and think about how it's connected to the greater world. So I can just think of a few key like ideas or things that it's related to. For example, this plant, this tree, is an endemic tree in Hawaii called Ohia Lekua. And it's a very important tree, not just for the Akepa, but many other Hawaiian forest birds. It has these beautiful red flowers. You can't really see them well here, but they have a lot of nectar, so they, they provide um, insects for the birds to eat, as well as nectar. Why the Hawaiian honey creepers, right? They're getting honey out of a plant like this. So the bird depends very much on the Ohia Lekua, but it goes deeper than that because this is a cavity nesting bird. Are there any woodpeckers in Hawaii? No, no, there's none. So where do the cavities come from? They come from just natural decay of where maybe a branch broke off of an old Ohia Lakua tree. And those cavities take a very long time to develop. Only in the oldest, old growth Ohia Lakua do you find those cavities. So these birds not only depend on that species of plant, particular plants of a certain age, which are rare in the environment. So you know, there, there's some connections there. Now, what's happening to the Hawaiian honey creepers? I'm not quizzing you guys, but what's, what's the biggest problem, arguably, besides habitat destruction? That's always number one. What, what are they suffering from? Invasives. Invasives, yes, for sure. I heard snakes. Um, not so much snakes. Thankfully, there are no snakes still in Hawaii. Um, what about the mosquitoes? Anybody know about that story? OK. So in Hawaii, there were no native mosquitoes before people showed up. Even when the native Hawaiians showed up, there were still no mosquitoes. They did not bring them. However, European whalers and colonizers came in the early 1800s. In their ships, there were inadvertently mosquitoes that got introduced. Those mosquitoes had inside of them avian malaria. So Hawaiian, the Hawaiian honey creepers are some of the most amazing birds in the world. This is the most isolated chain of islands in the world they are an amazing example of adaptive radiation, right? Probably one species arriving maybe five, six million years ago and radiating out into many amazing species, some with you know, long, crazy builds, you know, way more impressive than the Darwin finches in terms of their morphological diversity. Um, so they're there, and then these mosquitoes get introduced, and these things start going extinct, full on extinction of species. More than half, I think, now have gone extinct of the 50 plus species that were there originally. So that's one part of the story. Um, but why are these birds still surviving? They don't have resistance. The Akepa is not resistant to avian malaria. But it survives because those forest patches are at high elevation, where it's relatively cool. Mosquitoes don't go up there. So they can survive up there for now. And there's all kinds of programs that are trying to get rid of the mosquitoes. There's a lot going on with conservation. Um, but what's happening 
to temperatures around the world, including in Hawaii, They're going up, right? So that zone of cool temperature is going up the mountainside year after year. And so the mosquitoes are able to encroach further up the mountainside year after year. So it's a major, major problem. And so you can see these, these interconnections now that, because yes, and, it, and you guys said invasive species and you're right because the mosquito is an invasive species. And so we could keep going, right? We could talk about, I mean, it's, this is all kind of doom and gloom of conservation stuff, but um, you know, it just shows how everything is interconnected. Every, everything matters to everything else in many ways. We could do the same exercise for any bird in the world. Um, so you got one, your, your backyard bird here, the lovely scarlet tanager. Uh, we could talk about how this is a long distance migrant. And so that bird connects to very different parts of the world, sort of Northwestern South America where they spend the winter things they're eating there, the birds they're interacting with there. We could also talk about how the females sing in this species, right? And it's a kind of a fun thing. I did a whole episode on female bird song. We're all kind of finally appreciating that, right? Um, and, you know, talking about brood parasitism, right? The cowbirds that are laying their eggs in the nests of scarlet tanagers, and the tanagers, you know, trying to defend their nests when they actually see the cowbird, but if the cowbird gets past that defense, flops an egg in there, the tanagers tend to not recognize the egg as something foreign, and they raise those little cowbirds as their own. So there are these conceptual things, and that's important, is that there are these, it's not just physical connections between everything, but also conceptual connections. And so these are the kind of things we can think about for ourselves. These are the kind of things I try to include in the podcast. And, you know, boo, boo, right, European starling. But you can do this. I mean, starlings have so much that they can teach us, right? So many concepts, so many ways that they interact with the world, we can learn a lot from starlings through the same kind of exercise. So, birds and everything else in the universe, a very pretentious title, right? Because <laughs> we don't have much time here to talk about everything in the universe. But where does that come from? It comes from my absolute favorite quote by John Muir, which is, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And that, you know, was back in the 1800s, before the science of ecology really even existed, that's what he's talking about, is how everything really is connected. When none of us is, is not, no man is an island, right? Nobody's independent of everything else. Same goes for birds. But you can make that argument for anything. You, could, you know, it doesn't have to be birds. You could say, well, Ivan, you love frogs. You've got a tattoo of a frog in your arm. You don't have a tattoo of a bird for some reason. Um, why, not, why, not, why don't we say that amphibians or reptiles are the, the best lens to look at the universe and its connection? Well, you could. You could. Um, but, you know, how many amphibians or reptiles do you see on an average day compared to how many birds you see? Depends where you live. If you live at the edge of a pond, maybe you see a lot. But, um, you know, for the average person, if your goal is to, to connect people to nature, to understand the basic principles of science, natural history, amphibians be a little tough. Potential. Insects, right? Now, insects are everywhere. They're probably in this room right now with us, right? I've probably got some ticks on my leg. I know those are insects, but um, so you could make arguments for insects. They are wonderful, right? They're incredibly diverse. They're in most environments on Earth. Uh, but you know, people have some aversion to some of these things. Not everybody is super jazzed about invertebrates, insects. You can make the same argument for plants. They're everywhere. Many people do like plants. Um, you know, you can connect with them, but it's, it can be a challenge sometimes. So I, in my my opinion, it's very much an opinion, but I think informed, again, from the information I'm receiving from the world through this podcast thing, is that birds are, if not the best lens to look at all of these principles or to learn about the world, it's, they're one of the best ways to do this, right? Because they're in every, every terrestrial habitat, and they're in many marine habitats as well, at least on the surface. Um, they're conspicuous, they're colorful, they're vocal, they're active in the daytime, they're smart, behaviorally complex, all the reasons you're probably here today, the reasons we love birds, right? And the general public usually has a pretty favorable idea or opinion of, about birds. That's not always true about reptiles, amphibians, insects. People kind of just like birds, right? So um, they're really great for this. So I have come to think of the podcast a little bit like a Trojan horse. This wasn't my intention in the beginning, but I'm thinking, okay, yeah. I have this tool now to, you know, say, well, here's this podcast about birds. Please listen. But wrapped inside, you don't know this, but wrapped inside is 
you know, fun facts and interesting things about science, about you know, natural history of, of all kinds of things, different principles, maybe a little bit of human history, pop culture, humor, all these things that I can squeeze in there. Really, I should probably call it, you know, horses and three, maybe a Trojan turkey would be better. <laughs> this is my, you know, playing around with these AI things, man. It's crazy times, guys, that we're living in. I just typed in, you know, wooden Trojan horse, but in the form of a turkey, and then it spits out this kind of thing. <laughs> now, after the fact, I realized, you know, I probably should have done Trojan Trogon. That would have been better. Trojan, that would just, doesn't that sound Trojan Trogon? But, you know, turkey, turkey splendor, right? Turkeys are always fun. So that's the idea now, right? So I've kind of come around to this idea that I can package these things and do this with the podcast. Now, am I the best person to do this? Probably not. Am I the best person to provide a perch for a candidate day? Quite possibly. Ask, we'll have to ask the bird, but um, yeah, formerly known as Gray Jay, right? It's Canada Jay now. Um, I heard you guys got some of those around here, which is cool. So yeah, I'm not the, you know necessarily the best person for this. The podcast isn't necessarily the best way to accomplish these goals, but I'm trying and I'm putting my energy into it, and it feels really good. It's really fun. So this new media, right? Podcasting, but not just podcasting. YouTube, right? Anybody can start a YouTube channel for free. It doesn't cost anything. Um, this is something I'm going to get into more in the coming months and years. Do more videos in this same kind of style, educational. Hopefully, funny videos. Um, but it's, it's this democratization, right? Because anybody in this room could go home tonight and start a podcast. It doesn't have to be about birds. Hopefully not, because I don't want any competition. But you can start a podcast about, you know, I don't know what you get, you know, knitting, hockey. What do you guys do? Ski, you know, Olympic bobsledding. I don't know. Um, but you know, whatever you're passionate about and knowledgeable about, you know, it used to be you'd have to write a book, you'd be a publisher, there'd be, there'd be all these gatekeepers, right? Now. Just start a thing and do it well, and you can be reaching people around the world because this podcast, I mean, people in almost every country are listening to this thing, at least a little bit. So that is really, really exciting. And it's also a great way to learn as well, right? So my hope is that by teaching and learning about birds, the connections they have to everything else in the universe, this is corny, but <laughs> I think we can learn a little bit about ourselves. <laughs> and that, my friends, is as it. So if you have questions, I would be very happy to answer some. That's an interesting question. So if you didn't hear, she's asking, is there a topic for a podcast episode that I've been interested in or thinking about doing but that, that I have some resistance or difficulty with and I haven't yet done that for some reason? Um, let me think about that for a sec. I feel like there is something. I mean, you know, because again, I mentioned imposter syndrome right earlier, and it's something that many of us, people who are creating content in this modern world, have to, to grapple with, right? Because there are no, there aren't those um, gatekeepers to say, yes, you are allowed to do this. You can be a podcaster. You know, we just decide for ourselves, and so then we put ourselves out there as experts, which I don't say I'm an expert in birds, but um, and so I'm thinking that there might be some topics where I'm like, you know, that might not be, you know, something that I would feel, feel super comfortable talking about without a preface and without maybe saying, you know, guys, I'm going to talk about this, but this is just surface level. I'm not an expert. Um, if I can think of something, I'll let you know. I think there's somewhere inside of me that there's something that I've avoided a little bit. But, but otherwise, no. I mean, in general, you know, the beauty of this thing for me is that I learn. And so I, I do just say, well, okay, I don't know a ton about this right now, but let me dig into it. And as long as I feel like I understand it well enough, I think that, you know, through my education and all my experience as a, as a you know, guide and all that, that I have some of those tools, those skills, right, of taking something a little complex and hopefully distilling it for a general audience. So, that's right. Other questions? Yes. Uh, yes, this is more in a way of a comment than a question because I've heard some of your podcasts, and I anybody who has heard any of them will realize the incredible amount of research that has gone into producing these things. I'm absolutely 
amazed at how much work because I I can see it and you put it all together and you put it all together in a way that I never even could imagine. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's one of those things where I, I know we again we can all start a podcast. We can do all these things. It, it is available to all of us, um, but to do it well is another thing, right? And and. I appreciate that kind of feedback because I've, I've had enough of it to realize I think I'm doing this thing well. And yes, in order to do it well, it does take a lot of work. And I, I decided that early on. My very first episode was not scripted. I had an, out, an outline. It was about the evolution of birds. Um, no, the, the origin of birds, excuse me. And I did the whole thing. I edited it. You know, I recorded the whole thing. And I listened to it at the end. I go, nope, nope. It's, it's too too off the cuff, too rambling, even with editing and everything, I was just like, nope, I need to script this thing. So so I just, you know, I'm not a perfectionist. I wouldn't call myself that, but I try to put something out too. Because I, you, you wouldn't believe how many hours I've spent with EQs on my computer. There's too much bass there. Okay, no, no. And then, you know, like with little mouth noises. I mean, there's just, I'm bore you to tears talking about all the, the audio editing side of things. So anyway, thank you. Other other um, compliments. I've, I'm open for compliments. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, how does one monetize a podcast, right? So, so that is, uh, you know, something I've done, and, and it does take so much work. But I think if if I couldn't monetize it somehow, I think it would be challenging to justify the amount of work it put in. So, um, there's several ways you can do that. Um, what has worked really well for me to date is having supporters, a couple of which are in the audience right now, um, <laughs> that on Patreon, right? So this third party that, that people can sign up and say, okay, yeah, I'm going to give this guy $5 a month because I like what he's doing. And you can be $10 a month, $15 a month. You set these kind of prices and these tiers. They get some perks. They get some little fun things, maybe in exchange for that, maybe some behind the scenes stuff or the right to vote for a particular bird species on an upcoming episode. Um, so that has been great and that's been the primary thing for me. I have like 200 people now doing that. Um, one can also have ads. Most podcasts these days have some kind of ads either a, a sponsor or a little blurb at the beginning or in the middle so you get some money that way. You can sell your own products. I do have some t-shirts that I sell through the podcast that you know get a little bit here and there which is great. Um, you can you can go all the way on that if you want. So so yeah several ways. Um, I think there's one I'm missing but, but yeah those would be the main other good questions. What bad questions? Take them all. Way in the back. So you're new to the area? Have you had bird watching? No, I just got in yesterday, uh, and I and I wanted to get this done, and then I'm gonna go nuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I and I know some folks have given some great recommendations for places to go. Yeah. One well, more comment. Sure. After grabbing the question, uh, you're obviously a journalist rather than. And I'm focused on any particular bird and written a book on it. And it reminded me of this fellow who, uh, he just died about a year or two, well, well uh, who wrote about the world as being an organism where everything in it was connected. Right, the, the Gaia hypothesis, right? That everything yeah, in the world is yeah. is interconnected. Yeah, so, so I want to reiterate that <laughs> these ideas of everything being connected do not come from me. Um, they're just things that I think are really, really fascinating. And I think, you know, to me, you know, life is short and I want to learn as much as possible. And I think recognizing that things are interconnected like that is such a powerful thing. Um, because, yeah, if you just spend a time with a bird and think about, okay, well, what's it, what's it doing here? You know, what's it really doing? And, and you know, is it, is it, you know, it's obviously going to have to thermal regulate. Is it cold out? Is it fluffing its feathers up? What is it trying to find? Are the predators, you know, is it paying attention to its surroundings? It's just on and on and on. So, Yes, that I think that the Gaia hypothesis is very interesting. That the world, we can see the world, at least Earth, as an organism of, of interconnections. Very cool. Any other questions? Play with us? No? Okay. You're making my job too easy here, guys. You're supposed to grill me. <laughs> Who are you and how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. I appreciate being here. Thank you so much. Yeah. People have a yeah, let's chat. If you want to chat, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah.
but yes, thanks everybody for coming. If you have any questions about tomorrow's field trips, let us know. Um, and just really, it's great to have you all here. Super fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah, my group really enjoyed it. Hey, it's fun. Either virtually or Monday. I rebuild woodpecker. <laughs> and so when I did what happened there, which was it was amazing. They said absolutely that the Fontana was online and then the New York Birding Magazine contacted me and asked could they put the pictures in the issue? And I oh absolutely no, I was so honored and then they sent the magazine to me, sent them forever. But uh, it was so sad that these birds were there. Once those pictures have happened, so we're getting rid of all of these things around us. So it's so sad. 
Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people who need them actually like birds, they yeah. don't just don't get it or they yeah. stop yeah. the yeah. And we do get a lot of birds, but they're a lot of ones. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah. the brackets. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, the the yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, I love Jay's report. You guys have it. Go to Scrub Jay's. So sort of, that's kind. Oh, yeah, I, I, I used to see them on a near daily wow. thing. So where, where they live is where we live. That was yeah, like the one area. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I worked as a, a counselor at a school, and we had a lot of them actually flying around. I'd say every day, but not that every three or four days. Probably like that. You know, probably some I seen every day. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. We, and luckily, even in our neighborhood, we had this, and it wasn't really big by both of certainly this standard or out west, but there was a little, I don't, I don't, a little preserve in the middle of the neighborhood. There's school all around, and houses all around, golf courts and all that stuff. But maybe 300 acres, something like that, yeah. called the Lyman Year Preserve, and, and a lot of scrub tree habitat yeah. in the spot there, too. And yeah. right in the middle of the neighborhood, yeah, we literally was embarrassing through our neighborhood and things like that. So it was, it was, it was kind of cool awesome, to be able yeah. to see scrub jays. Um, that's probably another thing you realize how rare they are. You know, I'd never heard right. of what they were until we relocated there. And like, right. oh, this is a rarity. We go hiking around different places and see mm -hmm. them, and then see them in our neighborhood. And we're like, this is really cool. Yeah, like I said, I've done something very important. So that's those guys. Yeah. Go on. So that's I mean, cool, cool. very cool. It's, yeah, I was seeing them on a regular basis. Yeah, Kurt and I used to go out there. And I, I guess I never actively do this kind of thing. And he bring out, I got pictures of Lando on his head, his shoulder still, and all that. I've seen him close, but never had that kind of close. Yeah, yeah, Probably not a lot of reason to go there, but if you're really Del Toro, like I say, it's kind of between Orlando and Del Toro, it's like 90,000.
Yeah. 